Hello everyone, welcome to the Union. Uh, tonight we're very honoured to be able to host Professor Steve Jones. He is Professor of Genetics at University College London, as well as a television presenter and a prize-winning author on the subject of biology and especially evolution. Um, the writer and presenter of Radio 3 show Blue Skies and TV series In the Blood, he has written numerous books, some of which you can see up there, um, including Almost Like a Whale, The Origin of the Species Updated, and has a regular science column in the Daily Telegraph. A strong critic of what he terms the anti-science of creationism, Professor Jones's significant contributions to evolutionary biology and genetics won him the Royal Society's Faraday Prize in 1996. Please put your hands together for Professor Jones. Thanks for that uh, preemptive vote of confidence. Uh, I'm going to, I've given this talk a slightly odd title, which I'm sure many of you recognise. It's called Incest and Folk Dancing. And it's a quotation from Sir Thomas Beecham, the uh, conductor, who said, you should, everybody should try everything once apart from incest and folk dancing. Okay. Uh, he also said, um, uh, everything in music has its place, even brass bands, as long as they're in the open air and 20 miles away. So he was obviously quite a, a witty individual. Well, um, I've never gone in for folk dancing, um, but I have to say it's rather difficult to avoid incest in this modern world. I'd like, if you don't mind, to introduce each of you to your sixth cousin. Could you shake the hand of the person to your left? Do you have a person to your left? And those of you... Those of you of European ancestry are roughly speaking sixth cousins to each other, even if you don't know it. And even if you're, most of your parents, your ancestry comes from elsewhere in the world, you're probably seventh or eighth cousins. We're much, much more closely related to each other than we think, most people think. And as a result, most marriages, most matings are between relatives. In other words, um, they're to some degree incestuous. So much so, though you might try to avoid folk dancing, you can't avoid the other half of Thomas Beecham's equation. Okay, so why do, we, why do I think that we're all so closely related? It's a matter of simple arithmetic, actually. Here we have a picture of the apocalypse, okay? Uh, the end of time. And let's remind ourselves what happens. This is the Blake drawing of the apocalypse. Um, and let's remind ourselves what that is. That's when, uh, at the end of time, on the Day of Judgment, all the people on Earth who have ever lived will, come to, will rise from their graves and gather together on the plain of Armageddon, where they'll be separated into the righteous, who go to heaven, and the unrighteous, that's us lot probably, who will burn in hell forever and ever. Well, that's a nice little story. Uh, it actually has a real historic um, uh, background. This is a picture of a place I've been to, actually. It's the city of Megiddo in northern Israel, which is the biblical Armageddon. And the Armageddon story began with the destruction, <coughs> with the destruction of that city, um, by the uh, Assyrian king Sargon in 722 BC. And what happened was the people of the city were attacked, most of them were killed, and they were driven out into the wilderness. And that was actually the origin of the idea of the seven lost tribes of Israel, you may have heard of. And they, began, they generated among themselves the feeling that sometime in the future their descendants would return to that city at the end of time, and then uh, they would be back in the homeland where they felt that they belonged. Well, it's a very powerful legend. Um, and you can actually do some sums on it. Um, if uh, that happened in 722 BC, uh, we've all got, of course, two parents, four grandparents, eight great-grandparents and the like. We could multiply up how many people might be gathered at the, at the, um, at the um, time of Armageddon, which roughly speaking is 47 human generations ago, 47 to 50, and it's 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, um, 2048, and gone like this for hours. Um, if you do that 47 times, you come to um, 10 with something like, I can't remember the number, um, some 10 with something like uh, uh, 60 or so uh, zeros after it. And that would represent, of course, a ball of humans as big as the Earth expanding at the speed of light. And that clearly is not what's, ha what, what's going to happen. Why is that? It is because, of course, we don't have that number of ancestors. We may have two parents. We may have four grandparents. We may have eight great-grandparents. We probably haven't got 16 great-great-grandparents. And the further back you go, the more and more ancestors we share, because there simply weren't enough people around to allow us each to have our own independent 
family life. And that's what I want to really talk about, how we measure that and what the effects of that might be, um, in, um, in, in, particularly in genetics, but from other points of view. And you can illustrate this, I can, you can illustrate the power of this effect by something that was done by a Cambridge graduate, somebody whose career, I have to say, failed. Uh, he was the cousin of another Cambridge graduate, you've probably heard of, the, he was the cousin of Charles Darwin, okay, and his name was Francis Galton. And Francis Galton founded our lab at University College London in 1911, left a lot of money in 1911 to found what became the Galton Laboratory at UCL. And he was an extraordinary man in many ways. He, was, he wrote a book called Hereditary Genius, which is a deeply flawed book, but in some ways is described as, often described as the founding work of human genetics. He founded the non-science or the anti-science of eugenics, and he was interested overwhelmingly in human quality. And he measured this in many ways. He was a, an anthropologist, I suppose, really. Um, he was the only person, for example, as far as we know, to have made a beauty map of the British Isles. And we still have a little brass counting device, which he carried in the palm of his hand, when he moved from city to city, scoring the local women on a five-point scale from attractive to repulsive, um, making a map. Um, the low point was in Aberdeen. Uh, the high point was perhaps where it still is, outside Harrods in South Kensington. And that, that was a measure, an objective measure of human quality. And he was convinced that people of good quality were having fewer children than people of poor quality. And there's no evidence at all that's true, but that was his, that was his uh, interpretation. And he did an, a number of, um, of uh, related things. He was a man with a lot of money, not as much as Darwin. Darwin was a rich man. But he had the habit of going on walking holidays in the Italian part of Switzerland in about the 1860s or 1870s. And he turned up one year in what was then a very remote and isolated part of the world, landed himself in a Swiss village, mountain village, um, and noticed something very odd. And prepare yourself for a couple of crushingly bad jokes. He noticed that everybody in that village had the same surname. It might have been spaghetti, shall we say, weak joke. So he noted that was, wasn't of any great interest to him, but then he walked over the mountains to the next village, 15 miles away, equally isolated, equally poor. Everybody in that village had the same surname, Pasta, shall we say. Then the third village on the third day, Cannelloni. And he can carry on until he can't think of any more kinds of uh, farinaceous Italian food. And he began to wonder, why is this? Why has everybody in one village got a certain name and then another village got a different name? Maybe, he thought initially, the quality of the Pasta family is higher in village one and the quality of the Cannelloni family is higher in village two. And he couldn't quite work out why this was. But then he saw the answer. It arose from the fact that those villages were small and isolated and hence inbred in the sense that everybody shared an ancestor. And if you look into the, into the records of such places, it turns out, if you look into the church records, that maybe in 1500 AD, shall we say, when these, were start, these villages were founded, there might have been ten different names in every one of those villages. All, all villages had ten names. But every generation, just by chance, one man, or perhaps two men, had no sons. They had no children at all or had only daughters. So the number of names might go down to nine, then eight, then seven, and then ultimately one name automatically would take over. And everybody in that village would be related, descended from the person with that name in, uh, in the, when the village was founded. And because they were descended from the same person, they would be, because they're relatives, if they were to mate, they would be mating with a close relative. They have, would have highly inbred offspring. And the effect is really quite strong. There's a little simulation of it, and it's pretty elementary, showing the inheritance, not just of a name, but of a Y chromosome. And of course, as you all know, the Y chromosome is the male signifier, um, passed down the male line, like the surname in the traditional European system. And let's imagine we've got a population today with 22 people in it. Um, they descend from 18 uh, uh, 22 men in it, they descend from 18 fathers, because four of them, four fathers, four of their ancestors had no sons, and you can simply go back, back into history, until finally you get to a level where there's only one ancestor, male ancestor, to all the individuals in that population. Um, you can knock out all the people who didn't pass on their genes or their names. Um, you get what's called Merka, the most recent common ancestor of that uh, population. It, because we're talking genetics, there might, be change, you know, there might be changes and errors, and what will actually happen is some of those branches may pick up um, mutations, which allow you to trace the actual history of that Y chromosome. So everybody in the village is related. And Galton was convinced, on not very good evidence, that actually um, what that would lead to would be um, genetic disease, inherited disease, among their offspring. 
Now, his cousin, he was the cousin of Charles Darwin. Dalton himself had no children, in spite of his obsession with human quality. Um, this chap here did. Here's Charles Darwin. Uh, as academics, we don't see many of these things around, but there he is, Charles Darwin on the £10 note. You'd be interested to see, rather in brackets, there we've got some nice images, HMS Beagle um, and uh, a hummingbird. Um, and I thought, a hummingbird? Why a hummingbird? Uh, this is a Galapagos. There are no hummingbirds on the Galapagos. So I wrote to the Royal Mint about this, and uh, I said, well, why is there a hummingbird? And they wrote me back saying, oh, this is a hummingbird of the kind commonly found on the Galapagos. Uh, there are no hummingbirds on the Galapagos. Uh, so I think if you, next time you get a £10 note, tear it up, because it's got a big mistake on it. But still, be that as it may. Darwin himself married his cousin, Emma Wedgwood. Okay? And he was really very convinced, very concerned, that their offspring might be damaged, as Galton had suggested. Here's Darwin's uh, and Emma's pedigree. You can see they are the, uh, grand, the grandchildren of the same set of, uh, of uh, ancestors. Uh, and they had, in fact, in the end, ten children, three, seven of whom survived, and that was a lot in Victorian times. So there wasn't really much evidence of, uh, of um, any problem with inbreeding. But, Galton, but Darwin didn't know this. He wanted to, he wanted to find out what was, what was going on. Um, and he began to look into inbreeding stories. And it was very clear that there are clear problems, there are real problems in many creatures through inbreeding. Darwin wrote a book about it, um, not often read, it's a, he, he worked on plants. What Darwin actually, what the, Darwin's greatest um, contribution without doubt was effectively to invent the science of biology. Before Darwin came on the scene with the origin, there were plenty of people out there studying plants and animals, digging up fossils, breeding sheep and cattle, but they didn't actually realize that they were all doing the same thing, which is, of course, studying evolution. And what that meant, once you realize that, it doesn't matter what system you work on, you work according to the same rules. And it's remarkable that Darwin's interest in cousin marriage, he tested by working on flowers. He took hermaphrodite flowers and he mated them with themselves or with different individuals to see if there was any effect of inbreeding. And the answer is there was quite a severe effect. And he also noted that some of some animals too showed this effect. And you can see it quite strikingly with dogs. Darwin was a great dog lover. Um, he wrote again a book about domestication of animals in which he talks about the domestication of dogs. And the effect is really quite striking. Here we have a picture of a bulldog. I think a portrait of a bulldog painted in about 1817. And bulldogs were bred as herding dogs, herding bulls, and what they were bred to do, all the nasty animals, was to leap up and bite the face of a bull. So if they see something big and white, they'll leap up and they'll bite it. Um, and that is about the only way you can persuade a bull to do what you want a bull to do. And that's what bulldogs did. So the, the desire was by the breeders just to breed from those individuals with flat faces, who would get their teeth into a big, um, into a big uh, uh, bull's face and hang on. So they bred from a tiny proportion of all the animals they had. And that was 1817, and by 2008, this was the bulldog that won a prize at Crufts Dog Show. Um, and in fact, what had happened was it was fantastically inbred. Because they had only bred from a tiny number of individuals, this bulldog um, was descended from just a very, very few ancestors who may well have carried a lot of damaging genes, which were showing their harmful effects when they came out in double copy. And that effect is sometimes, extre is sometimes extreme. Here we, people, re we've recently sequenced the dog genome three years ago now, four years ago now, um, and people have looked at different dog breeds. Now, the interesting thing about ourselves as human beings is actually, if you look at humans from different parts of the world, they're remarkably similar. We may look a bit different in terms of skin color and the like, but on the average, we're astonishingly, we're astonishingly similar to each other, much more than any other mammal, really. Dogs are quite different. If you look at different dog breeds, this is a, this is a computer program, uh, which sorts them by genetic difference. If you look at the bottom line, every color bar shows a different identity. And you'll see that the identity of dog breeds like huskies is really totally different from things like um, border collies or things like, uh, things like poodles. They are very, very distinct. They've been divided up into very, very distinct groups, each of which descends from a very small number of ancestors. Uh, the classic case of that is the uh, King Charles Spaniel, which has a gene. Uh, with the, there are something like 15,000 King Charles Spaniels in Britain, all of whom descend from fewer than 50 animals in 1970. Okay? And one of those animals in 1970 must have carried a single copy of a gene for an illness we also get in humans called syringomelia, which really leads to the brain swelling up, so much so that it 
it bursts out of the cranial cavity and the animal is either paralysed or dead. And you can see uh, King Charles Spaniel's owners actually uh, operate in order to reduce pressure on the brain. So the effect is very real and actually really quite, consider quite considerable. So Darwin was knew, knew about this and was very worried about it. And he wanted to know about its effects on, on, on human populations. And he knew indeed that there were some extraordinarily inbred families. Um, here's one. Um, Geneticists work on various creatures. We work on fruit flies. I worked on snails. Most people work on worms. Um, but we like most of all to work on the royal family. And there are, we've been lost without the royal family, I can tell you. They show you all the things that can go wrong in human genetics uh, with stark accuracy. And inbreeding is a classic example. Here we have the Europeans of the, uh, of the mainly the, uh, the Bourbons, the Spanish royal family. Uh, these are the number of ancestors these people had. At, uh, at, six, at six generations, shall we say, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64. They should have had 64 ancestors at six generations, 128 at seven generations. And you can see that somebody like Alfonso XII, the king of Spain, instead of having over 100 distinct ancestors seven generations back, had only eight. Okay? And that's because cousin marriage after cousin marriage after cousin marriage had taken place. He actually married Queen Victoria's granddaughter in an attempt to bring some good blood into his line, as he thought. Unfortunately, she brought in the haemophilia blood clotting gene. But that's, that's another story. So there's plenty, there's plenty of, um, of inbreeding. And uh, if you look at history books about, the, about the, that family, uh, they describe the, them in term Philip V, unbalanced, uh, Ferdinand IV, over-sensual, Isabel II, nymphomaniac, Alfonso, Alfonso XII, tubercular. Right? So there's tons and tons of inbreeding, and it does really quite a lot of harm. Some royal families have gone even more than that. It's pretty clear that the pharaonic families, the families of Egypt, were classic brother-sister mating. Uh, there was tons and tons of brother-sister mating that went on. Um, uh, uh, Tutankhamun himself was the offspring of a brother and sister. And Cleopatra may have been the offspring of four generations of brother-sister mating. It's a bit confused because it's hard to know quite who mated with whom. And some of her supposed um, female ancestors were in fact male, which makes it a bit difficult. Um, but clearly there is a lot of inbreeding of that kind. Um, oh, lost me slides, okay. So that's what happens um, on extreme inbreeding. Well, you might think that kind of thing doesn't really happen, shall we say, in the British royal family, but it does. Here's um, Prince Charles and uh, no longer ex extant Lady Di. What you can see in, um, is that actually uh, each of Charles and Di are descended from the same from the same ancestor in the early Middle Ages, and with the confessor, there he is at the top, and because we have a very good pedigree, it turns out that Prince Charles is descended from Edward the Confessor through 3,000 different lines of descent. And Lady Di, who's actually much more aristocratic than Prince Charles was, is descended from, four, from him by 4,000 distinct lines of descent. Which means that their children, their two sons, definitely have two copies of particular genes born by Edward the Confessor, which they've inherited by virtue of the fact that their parents are related to him in so many different ways. So even the noble and totally healthy and normal British royal family has quite a lot of, uh, of inbreeding. So what can we do from that point of view with genetics? Well, what genetics has done is to turn us all, really, into aristocrats. Because every one of us, of course, carries within ourselves our entire family history, not just back to Edward the Confessor, Edward the Confessor but back to the origin of life three and a half thousand million years ago. And because we can now sequence DNA at such speed, it turns out that we can actually make some very precise statements about who's related to whom, who's inbred and who isn't. I was talking to somebody in uh, UCL the other day, um, and he reckoned, and he's probably right, that by the end of this year we can, we'll be able to sequence uh, an entire human genome in 15 minutes for a thousand dollars. And given that the initial job, done partly here in Cambridge, took 15 years and cost many millions of dollars, that's pretty impressive. And what that means, of course, almost certainly all of you, perhaps me too, will have their DNA sequenced as part of the normal medical diagnostic um, issues. Um, I'm always cursing students for doing this. I'll leave it ring and stop it before. Um, uh, well, where was I? Uh, it'll, be, it'll be done as a normal diagnostic issue uh, to students. Okay. So we'll know a lot about our ancestry. 
And if you do that, you get some really rather interesting patterns. One of the things which has been done really quite recently is to, do, to compare the patterns of genetic distribution of variation on the Y chromosome and on the surname. And in some ways, they are pretty much the, um, they're pretty much the same thing. What you can do is you can ask, is there any fit between a particular surname and a particular form of the human Y chromosome? And the answer is yes, sometimes there is. It's particularly helpful for rare surnames. It's a name like mine, Jones, is useless, or Smith is even more useless. And that's because a name like Smith, of course, has originated many, many times in different family lines from people who are blacksmiths. Jones, um, Welsh name, naturally, just means son of John, and Welsh names were forced upon us by the nefarious English in about 1700 AD when we moved from the old system of calling yourself after your father and your grandfather towards calling yourself a fixed surname. So Jones and Smith are useless, but rare names are much more impressive. Here's a, some Y chromosome pedigrees for various names. Um, interestingly enough, the guy who did this, who's actually again here at Cambridge, uh, is a great admirer of David Attenborough. Um, so he took the Attenborough name, and he found about 20 people with the name Attenborough, and uh, he asked, do they share a common Y chromosome? And that key there on the top right is just the name of a different Y chromosome identity. Okay. The Y chromosome has lots of variation along its length, and so you can identify particular Y chromosomes. There's the Attenborough, and they nearly all have an identical Y chromosome. Maybe one or two minor mutations. The Smith, these are a random collection of British surnames, and they're not related to each other. These are the Smiths, of whom there are 560,000 people in Britain, God help us, um, and, uh, but only 932 Attenboroughs. And you can see, indeed, there's a striking fit between surname and, uh, and, um, and Y chromosome. So they do overlap. Now, in fact, British surname, English surnames, not Welsh surnames, on the average are 700 years old. That's when we can trace the average English surname to. Um, Chinese surnames, Li is the commonest surname in the world. Chinese surnames, um, are, are their average depth, their origin is 5,000 years. Okay. So Chinese, actually, are pretty inbred because they, they can descend, they can chase their ancestry back, many of them, to the same individual. Japanese surnames, for poor people, only started 100 years ago. So uh, it's very difficult to trace their history. So there are some even more striking fits of surname <coughs> with, um, with genes, which suggest that the two go together. Uh, the famous example comes from Ireland. There are various families in Ireland who believe themselves, people like the O'Connells, let's say, they believe themselves to be descendants of the same individual, the same man, who was called King Neil of the Nine Hostages, who lived in the 5th century. And he founded the High Kings of Ireland. And he was basically a warlord, um, like he was a marauding kind of lunatic of the kind of career around the countryside, as they did all over Western Europe in those days. <clears throat> and uh, he was well known to have had uh, many children, many sons, by many different women. His sons became kings and wards. They had many sons and the like. Um, and it turned out, and, and many families claimed descent from this individual, which sounds like an interesting but unlikely tale, but turns out to be true. If I were to look at the set of Y chromosomes in this room, I'd be pretty confident that, that most of the males here had their own distinct Y chromosome. In England, um, very few Y chromosome types ra raise, uh, become more frequent than about one in 100, one in 200. There are lots and lots of rare and distinct Y chromosome types. Ireland isn't like that. Here we have one particular Y chromosome type, which actually as many as one man in six in certain parts of Ireland actually carries. They, they all belong to these surname groups, so Connells and the like, who believe themselves to be descended from the High Kings of Ireland, and they probably are. In other words, they are, probably do carry uh, the Y chromosome of King Neil of the Nine Hostages. So what you can actually do quite well with surnames, given that they overlap pretty well with genetic variation, is you can work out the extent of inbreeding within a population by asking a very simple question. What is the number of surnames in relation to the number of people? If, in a particular population, everybody has the same surname, as Galton found more or less in his Italian villages, they probably all descend from somebody who lived quite recently in the past. If there are lots of different surnames, they didn't. They're mixed up. And actually, even in Britain, there are some striking patterns. Uh, this rather peculiar map of Britain simply has, shows you that the, um, that the, the population density, okay? And what the colours show you, the amount of diversity in a surname. And it's interesting, in West Wales, where I come from, there, 
colours are sort of pale grey, and there's not much diversity. But that's for a different reason. The surnames were all given quite recently, Jones, Evans, Smith, Jones, Evans, Pritchard, and the like. Um, in London, of course, there's a vast diversity of surnames, because there are people from all over the world in London. But if you go, and I'll return to this at the end of the talk, if you go to this remote country in the far north, and look at these islands up here, the Hebrides, the, the, the Orkneys, and the Shetlands, actually there's very little surname diversity. There are a few very common surnames, um, like Carr and the like, um, but uh, there's very little diversity. So you can, in principle, you can measure diversity um, uh, from, by measure inbreeding by looking at surname diversity in a population. So what are the patterns of inbreeding across the world? Many people think that cousin marriage is kind of rare and that inbreeding doesn't really happen. That's wrong. Cousin marriage is common, and it's getting common. It's particularly common in the Islamic world. It's also common in certain subgroups um, in, in, in Hindu religions where there are strong pressures to marry a cousin. Um, one of the commonest marriage types is uncle-niece marriage. In you, you marry your brother's daughter. And that's even more closely inbred than marrying somebody who shares a grandparent with you, which is a cousin. And you can draw a map of the proportion of consanguineous marriages, as they're called, across the world. Um, and you can see that in some parts of the world, for example in Saudi Arabia, um, as many as half or more of all marriages are of this kind, of cousins. Um, and in fact, as this has gone on for many generations, of actually much closer than cousins, because inbreeding builds up over, over the generations. Um, in some places, for example, in uh, parts of southern Iran, as many as 90% of all marriages are between close relatives. Now the question arises, was Colton right in, um, in asking uh, it suggested that this leads to health problems. And Darwin, as I said, was very interested in that. Darwin was a, a, an amazing genius. He was the guy who first worked out the surname story. And he re realised that actually a very good way of looking at the extent of inbreeding was to ask how often do people with the same surname marry? If Darwin were to marry somebody called Darwin, it's highly likely that they'd be related you know, from the, in the near past. So we, that's called isonomy, and there's an awful lot of that work goes on. Darwin did some more eccentric things. He tried to get, um, he tried to get a question put into the 1871 census about uh, cousin marriages. Are you married to your cousin? And this was, of course, uh, this was thrown out in the House of Commons, uh, allegedly because it was, uh, it was, uh, it was uh, very rude and intrusive. But in fact, of course, Queen Victoria was married to her cousin, and you couldn't possibly suggest that there anything wrong with Queen Victoria. So that didn't come in. He began to, he sent questionnaires to people in lunatic asylums to ask whether they'd been uh, the offspring of cousins. But as they were so mad, he got no, let, almost no letters back. And he did something very odd in Oxford and Cambridge. He asked the question, is it the case, <clears throat> what is the incidence of cousin marriage, descent from two related people, in the boat race crews of Oxford and Cambridge in the various colleges, versus the general mass of nerds amongst whom we might, we must, we might count ourselves? And he found quite a striking effect that you were much less likely to get into the boat race crew than if you were the descendant of a cousin marriage. Perhaps because um, this maybe reduced your physical um, strength and your health, or maybe not. It was a pretty feeble piece of, it's a pretty feeble observation, but it's slightly odd. But now we know the effect is very real. Actually, cousin marriage does quite a lot to damage the offspring of those who um, emerge from such a mating. Why should that be? It's because we all contain a massive amount of genetic diversity. Everybody in this room <coughs> is different genetically from everybody who ever has lived or ever will live in the future. Even more remarkably, given that one DNA base in a thousand, on the average, varies from person to person, every sperm and every egg ever made by every man or ever woman, every woman who has ever lived is different from all the others. And given that um, every time a man has sex, he makes enough sperm to fertilize every woman in Europe, that's a lot of difference. Okay? So we're enormously different. And many of those differences, as we geneticists and many of you will know, are cause recessive genetic diseases, which don't have any effect if you've only got one copy of the gene, but if you have two, can be absolutely damaging. Uh, fortunately, I forgot to bring my um, Mendelian magic wand with me, which I wave over my first year genetic class in UCL, and I say, waving the wand, that uh, I have made all of you homozygous, in other words, I have two copies, uh, identical copies of the genes you carry, and all of you will now die on the average two and a half times. So every one of us has single copies of the gene, of two and a half genes, that if we were, had double copies of them, would kill us. 
Now, you're much more likely to get double copies of a particular gene if you are the offspring of close relatives, because if you're cousins, let's say, you share grandparents in common, and if your shared grandparent had a single copy of a damaged gene, it's much more likely that your children are going to have two copies of that gene that if two random people mate, um, uh, uh, two random people in a population mate. And the effect, as I say, is quite big. What it basically does is double the amount of, uh, of morbidity and mortality. And these are figures from the Northern European population versus the British Pakistani population. And the Pakistani population of Branford is among the most inbred populations in the world. And that's largely because of their own traditions of cousin marriage and also because many of them marry their cousins who are back in Pakistan in the hope or the, with the effect of giving them entry to Britain. And the effect is really not, is not that small. It's quite striking. You can see, for example, death within a month goes up by about three times for the offspring of cousin marriage, um, congenital malformations go up, spontaneous abortions go up, and all these things. Uh, now, this, this isn't the end of the world. 99% of all children are born healthy. So, the, for, um, for cousin marriage, 98% are born healthy. Uh, but wherever you are, whatever the death rate is, it, and it may be much higher in places like Africa, in general, and there are complicating factors to do with socioeconomic questions. In general, the amount of mortality and morbidity of cousin marriages goes, goes up. So it's really, it's really quite striking. And that's why people in the last two or three years have become very interested in the global maps of, um, of, uh, of, 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 co of cousin marriage. One thing which is very clear is that the amount of inbreeding is quite, is quite different in different parts of the world. Partly for cultural reasons, but much more so for historical reasons. Um, here's a map which shows the pattern of human movement across the globe in the last 80, depending who you depend, depending who you believe, in the last 80,000 years since we left Africa, or according to your paper in last week's Nature, which of course you have this week's Nature, which this week's Science, which you have of course um, read, um, uh, we left we left uh, 120,000 years ago. But whenever we left, we're all, we're all Africans, but and we left and we spread across the world. And this rather peculiar map at the top is an attempt, and it's guesswork really, to show the pass the, pa the pathways we took as we spread. And we got to certain parts of the world really quite recently. We got to the New World not much more than 21,000 years ago when the Bering Land Bridge was there and people walked across the Bering Land Bridge. Um, and what you can do is to measure the amount of genetic diversity in relation to the distance from Addis Ababa um, in kilometers following one of these tracks, which means, is, means you have to go round the Himalayas and you're not allowed to swim the Pacific. You have to follow the actual distance we travel. And what you find is that the amount of variation in these populations goes down very strikingly as we move away from Addis Ababa. You can see, if you go to Africa, those orange spots, there's much more variation among Africans as a whole. Um, if you, as you move into Europe, there's less variation in Europe. As you move into East Asia, those yellow spots, there's less again. And then finally, in the Americas and in Oceania, places like New Zealand and Hawaii, there's much less variation again. And that's because as you move away from Africa, you, we get more and more inbred because populate, the population went through bottleneck after bottleneck. We basically were moving villages um, of maybe 50 or 100 people, and as we moved, and got the, uh, uh, people, uh, there was a shortage of mates, and hence the amount of genetic diversity went down. Okay. Now, that's was, this was discovered probably, it's been known in general terms, for about 20 or 30 years. Uh, the details were discovered maybe five or six years ago. But now we can actually do much more. Because what we can actually now do is to look, quite literally, at genetic surnames. What is a surname? A surname is a bunch of letters, J-O-N-E-S, which is passed down the generations as a block. Okay, or Attenborough, you pass down the generations as a block. And basically, if you look at the genome, the DNA, <coughs> the Y chromosome, definitely, because the Y chromosome is preserved in almost entirely as a block. But even if you look at a section of DNA, a few hundred or thousand DNA bases long, most of the time it is not reshuffled. Geneticists are obsessed with sex. Um, and my first. Uh, first of many weak jokes in my genetics lectures that you see, is to stand up in front of the first year class and say, I am a geneticist and my job is to make sex boring. And all the kids look at me blankly. Well, I'm now into lecture, what is it? Lecture 12 tomorrow morning and I've certainly made it pretty damn boring and it's going to get more boring as well. Um, but <coughs> what do we mean by sex in genetical terms? We mean recombination. 
we mean the generation of one individual from two, which itself is pretty weird, and the mixing together of the genes of those two individuals. And certainly, if you look at chromosomes and that kind of stuff, uh, the, the genes of the parents are mixed together. They're reshuffled when you look at the offspring. But if you look at short lengths of DNA, they're not. It takes a, it takes a, lot, of, um, a lot of shuffling to break up some of these short lengths of DNA. You can see it um, uh, by what's called the rather jaw-breaking phrase, runs of homozygosity. And homozygosity simply means having two copies of the same genetic variation. If two people get called Attenborough, marry, okay, and Attenborough marries an Attenborough, and you've got a run of homozygosity of the name in their offspring, okay? If two people with a length of DNA that looks like that, um, in the same place, marry, their offspring have a run of homozygosity, uh, double copies of that particular, I think it's a 12-letter um, 12 letter identity. But you can find uh, double copies of, of these runs, as they're called, which aren't 12 letters long, they're thousands of letters long. And the longer the run, hom the run of homo homozygosity is, the more likely it is that that population is inbred. Because the way you get these runs is by people uh, with the same shared ancestors marrying each other. And the more recent their shared ancestor, the less time there's been to break up by the genetic reshuffling that happens um, um, by recombination um, every generation. You can illustrate it mythically with a surname. You might have a Galton marry a Darwin. Um, now and again, the uh, DNA <coughs> breaking and recomb recombining process will lead to a new kind of mixture called Galwin and Darton. Uh, so that's what recombination actually is. So what you can do is to go out and you look at populations and ask, how many of these long blocks of shared DNA, common DNA, along the genome are there? And the more they are, the more there are, the more inbreeding there is. Well, here's some work done really quite recently <clears throat> on the place where I actually did my PhD work many years ago. Um, I'm, the, as I frequently say, one of the world's top six experts on the genetics of land snails, and the other five agree. Um, and uh, I did my PhD work on the borders of Bosnia and Croatia long before they started murdering each other. Actually, it was one of the intervals between they'd been murdering each other for much of the Second World War, and then they started again, of course, when Milosevic got going. But I was there in the 60s, and it was still relatively calm. And occasionally, we used to go out to the islands and pick up snails. <clears throat> and we thought, you know, what strange places they were. And it turns out that these islands are tremendously inbred. They're little villages on the, off the Croatian coast, islands off the Croatian coast, with, with people who have lived in those villages for hundreds and hundreds of years with almost no movement in and off the island. And what you can do is look at their DNA. And what you find, this takes, a bit of, this takes a little bit of talking about, these are the, run, the length of those genetic surnames, those runs of homozygosity. And let's just talk about the enormously long ones, OK? These are people, the proportion of the population, which has got shared double copies of DNA more than 10,000 bases long. And that's long, all right? And you can see the red, you know, the brownish color, that's about 20% of, of those island populations have got shared double copies of long lengths of DNA. <clears throat> if you look at the islands of Orkney, north of Scotland, that's almost as true there. Orkney, it turns out, is tremendously inbred, which nobody really knew before. And it's really rather surprising but seems to be the case. Then you move to uh, the mainland of, um, of, um, of, uh, of, of Croatia, and it drops again, and then you get off to, to the general Scottish and European population. And there's hardly anybody in this room, for example, who will have a length of double copy DNA 10,000 bases long. So you can, you've now got a mechanism whereby you can go into populations or into people, and simply by reading their doubled DNA sequences, you can ask how inbred are they? Are there? Well, it turns out, first of all, that there are, it, it fits very well um, what you know from pedigrees. This is the F of the inbreeding measured by pedigrees against the inbreeding measured by the technique we just talked about. And if you go across the world, you get, again, quite a striking picture. Um, what you actually find is that in, uh, that in Ocean Oceania, okay, this is, a lot, this is the lengths, this one again, uh, the, the islands like Hawaii and Tahiti, tremendous inbreeding, not surprisingly, because people were confined on those islands. Lots and lots of double copies. In South America, lots of inbreeding. In Central Asia, a bit less. In West Asia, um, in, in East Asia, less again. But in Europe, less again. And in Africa, almost none. 
So much more inbreeding in the new world than in the old world, and much and more inbreeding in Asia than in Europe, which fits exactly what we know about the movement of people across the world. But why should we, why should we be worried about that? What's the point of it? I mean, it's, it's fun, but is there a point? Well, the answer is, rather alarmingly, that there does seem to be a point. Because there does seem to be, on very preliminary evidence, and this stuff is very new, that at least for some diseases, people who are revealed by virtue of this technique to have emerged from incestuous, if you want to use that that word marriages, are more susceptible to illness than others are. Here's a pet paper that came out a couple of years ago. This has to do with a colon cancer. Um, right? And what we've got is um, the number of long lengths of DNA on different chromosomes. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In a bunch of colon cancer patients, about, six, about a couple of hundred of them, and in this, this look at this, these are just control populations. And these are the numbers of individuals. But you can see that the numbers of those double lengths are much, much higher in cancer patients than those in those who are controlled and are healthy. So that actually being inbred seems to have quite a striking tendency to increase the risk, at least of colon cancer. Although I have to say, very recently, in the last couple of weeks, um, there's been people who have not found this in, for example, breast cancer. But it's certainly a strong effect. If you look at, just count the number of those black blobs um, along the chromosomes that are far more in that group of colon cancer patients than in the same number of healthy people. And that's not just that is true. <coughs> Here's an the, the effect of, um, of uh, infectious disease um, by, in relation to inbreeding. And you can see, again, if you're inbred, you're much more likely to get uh, to get. Uh, septic bacteremia to have a blood infection, meningitis, which is a brain infection, uh, sepsis when birth and birth and so on. So again, inbreeding has a big effect. And of course we'll be able to measure this for all of us in the near future with the greatest of ease. So I think it actually it's going to be quite an important medical technique. And it's going to have bad news for some people and good news for others. Let me just very briefly begin to end up and talk about the bigger question. And the bigger question is, all right, maybe there are two big questions in biology, one of which is often asked, but hasn't been answered. What's the point of males? Okay. Why do females, why do women allow men to get away with it? Why do they allow, uh, why do they copy male genes um, to allowing males to get a free ride? And that's an interesting and baffling um, uh, question. And the other which is related to it is, why are babies born young? How can two elderly and rather decayed bits of protoplasm, like all of us, of course, some more decayed than others, possibly, get together and, with a simple gesture, produce a brand new piece of protoplasm. It's kind of weird, isn't it? Well, we kind of partly know the answer. I spent some time, some years ago, um, looking at the first question, asking about sex. All right? What is the point of evolution of sex? And Darwin, of course, himself asked the question. Darwin always asked the right questions. And uh, he didn't really find the answer. He thought it was actually related to inbreeding. He found that when he self-fertilized his flowers, um, really inbred them, they were less healthy. But he didn't really find the answer. So I decided, having worked for some years on, on, <coughs> on um, snails, to broaden my interest very considerably and to move and work on slugs instead. Okay. Slugs, you'd be glad to know, uh, all were snails once. Uh, they're snails that have lost their shells. And there's one particular species, the black slug, it's a, you'll see it's a big oozy slug that's around the place that's called Orion Ata. And it's an interesting species, it's a hermaphrodite, and there's plenty of hermaphrodite animals, invertebrates. Um, don't we believe that the, none of them went in for sex with themselves? But they do. Snail, uh, slugs, the slug sex life is quite amazing and astounding. It really makes me blush to think about some of it. Um, they are hermaphrodites, and of course if you're a hermaphrodite, boy girl meets girl boy. Okay? And what you want to be under those circumstances, you want to be the boy. You want to fertilize the other individual and then to beat it as quickly as possible before you get fertilized yourself. And I don't know if you've ever seen any film of this, but slug sex is amazing. They hang on big slime um, trails from a tree and they go round and round and round and they hit each other with their penises for hours on end. And then in, in one particular species, one of them succeeds in mating, mates with uh, the, his partner, withdraws his penis, uh, bites it off, and inserts it into his own female aperture and then beats it um, so that his partner can't then mate him, can't mate with him. Anyway, that's another story. Um, what we've got here are these hermaphrodite slugs. Now, if you're a hermaphrodite, you're always open to a temptation. 
It's what Woody Allen calls sex with somebody you really love, that is yourself, okay? And so you can mate with yourself. And it turns out that these slugs can do that. And if you mate with yourself, very, that's about as extreme inbreeding as you can possibly imagine. All right? You can't get much more inbred than that. And if you do that, what actually happens is that all the genetic variation very quickly goes away. So if you go out and you look at the DNA of these populations of slugs, which you, if you find populations with no variation at all in them, they're almost certainly mating with themselves. There's no sex involved. They're self-fertilizing. Self if you find lots of variation, then it turns they're probably having by girl meets girl boy, normal sex. And here's a very... There's, <coughs> there's, um, if, you go to, if you go to the north of England... Um, well, from slugs' point of view, actually, sex basically stops at Preston. As you go north, north of Preston... All slugs of this particular type are genetically identical to each other. South of Preston, they become more variable. In Cambridge, I have to tell you, we did collect them 25 years ago, they did seem to be self-fertilizers, but I'm sure things have changed since then. Uh, what you can do is you can look at it uh, using DNA, and if you look at DNA gels, this is a very old and primitive DNA technology. This is what happens in Oxfordshire, they're all different. This is from the Isle of Skye, they're all the same. And that actually turns out to be very common. In northern places, for plants and animals, if they can self-fertilize, they will. Why is that? It's because in northern places, you have to face enemies which are always the same. Cold, star... I mean, I spent ten years in Edinburgh, so I know all about it. Cold, starvation, depression, Scots, that kind of stuff. Nothing ever changes. Um, all right? So your enemies are always the same. So if you can generate a set of genes which is very good at dealing with those enemies, it pays you to keep them as one block by self-fertilizing. And that's a common pattern. As you go up in the mountains or to the north or to the far south of South America, all kinds of plants in particular take up self-fertilization. But if you're in the tropics, your enemies aren't like that. Your enemies aren't climate and starvation. They tend to be diseases. Okay? Um, and if the disease organism itself is sexual, you have no choice but to become sexual yourself. It becomes a bit like um, a, a race, the, queen, the red queen, as it's sometimes called. Once one creature becomes sexual, all the others have to follow because you may be resistant to the, to, to the disease organisms for most of the time, but it's a bit like playing cards. You may have a set of cards that give you three aces and a king, and you use those all the time, you nearly always win. And then one day the disease organism with its sexual reshuffling gets four aces and you're done for. So actually that's why sex emerged, or one theory why sex emerged, it has to do with the need to withstand disease. And it's interesting, is it not, that there is indeed a fit in the humans, as we've just seen, between how inbred you are and your susceptibility to infectious disease. So there may be some um, overall uh, truth coming out here. Well, let's... And I'll end up now by asking about the future of this. Okay. We've seen that as we moved across the world, we became more and more inbred. Well, now, of course, we're moving across the world in a different sense, in that, as you look at the people in the streets of Cambridge, even in Cambridge, you can see people from, with ancestry from every continent, and in London, of course, much more again. And Britain is amazingly open is an, in terms of interracial mating, uh, at least between some groups. I read the other day the astonishing statistic that half the kids in Britain with one Afro-Caribbean parent, the other parent is white. So, in other words, there are almost no social barriers between, um, between matings uh, based on skin colour, Afro-Caribbean to European. They're much, much less strong than the stronger social barrier, apart from religion, of course, which is a separate issue, um, which is education. You're much more, any one of us, any one of you, is much more likely to, measure, to, to marry somebody of a different racial group who's got a BSc or a PhD than to marry of the same racial group who hasn't got any O-levels. So that's a real barrier to mating. But the traditional barriers, which are, I suppose you might call them racial barriers, I wouldn't use that phrase, are going away. And you can see that in, a glo in the global sense. What you, can, you can actually see it genetically, first of all. This is the... Um, the lengths of the runs of homos, those blocks of DNA, in relation to the birth date of a cohort of Americans, people born in 1900, 1920, 1940, how many double copies of long lengths of DNA have they got, and you can see a dramatic decrease with time. And that's, uh, that's also, that's, uh, it's going to accelerate, there's no question of that. But you don't need the DNA, you've got the names. And at UCL, we have a big surnames register where they've taken the names from various censuses and they painted them as maps across Britain. And what you can do is make a map that shows the distribution of certain aristocratic surnames, mine, for example, 
um, at different times. This is the name Jones in 1881, census of 1881. Uh, and as you can see, we were confined, more or less, behind Office Dyke, um, not allowed to leave our reservations. I was born in this extremely Welsh place on the west coast of Wales there. And certainly in my village, I think everybody was half the people who were called Jones and the others were called Evans, which is actually the same name, both my son and John. Um, now, to get onto this map as a colour, you have to rise more to be more than 1% of the population. So there were Joneses scattered about, but they were rare elsewhere in Britain. Things have changed. The Joneses are on the move. We haven't, we haven't quite got to Cambridge yet. Um, but I look forward to it in 100 years or so. We may have 1% of Joneses in Cambridge. So that name has spread out across the country. And of course, that process is an indicator of much more outbreaking. You're now much more likely to marry somebody much less likely to marry somebody with the same surname um, as yourself, as you would have been even 100 years ago, probably even 50 years ago. So I think in the, um, in the end, I think we can say that inbreeding has really formed a lot of what makes us what we are. It has a lot of relevance to medicine, probably more than we thought it has. But in 100 years from now, we'll all be mongrels and we'll have to worry about it. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Are there any questions? Is it going to be in the exam? Go on, that's for that. They always mine always. Yeah. Is it easier to design drugs? Say again? Is it easier to design drugs by inbred populations? Well, I'm not sure anybody's really done, done that. Um, that. I mean, the question of drugs and genetics is an interesting one. There was, as I'm sure you know, um, about five years ago, maybe four years ago, pharmacogenomics, as it was called, was the coming thing. There was a strong feeling that there would be um, development of a new medicine, personalized medicine, so-called, um, which would everybody have a, would have a little test and would show them what medical drugs would work for them. Okay. And clearly, there's some truth in that, in some cases. You used to be able to buy a, a painkiller called codeine across the counter. Uh, not a good idea. It's uh, dangerous stuff. You can't buy it across the counter anymore. Um, but for 90% of people, it worked pretty well. Europeans, it worked pretty well. Um, and the reason it worked was it was broken down in the body with an enzyme um, to make another painkiller called morphine. Okay? But for 10% it didn't work at all because they didn't have this enzyme. So clearly you'd have to, you'd have to um, define uh, the amount of drug you, the drug you took by what your genes were. Um, alcohol is another drug which I believe people have occasionally been known to ingest. And there are places in the world where 90% of the population cannot drink alcohol because they can't break it down. But the hope by the pharmaceutical industry that they would make a huge amount of money, which is what drives the pharmaceutical industry, by selling tests to, uh, to tell people, this is your set of genes, and these are the medicines that are good for you, and these are the medicines that are bad for you. That really hasn't worked. It hasn't, these, these things, you know, these examples are quoted, they are the exception rather than the rule. And so I, do, I think in the end, um, the notion that maybe inbred populations are easier to, to treat because they're all the same, it's a good idea, but I don't think it will probably, probably won't work out in the end. When you get back to one ancestor, and then from then on it's one, 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 one. Okay? I mean, it's clearly the case that there was somebody alive on Earth who was Adam, okay? Who was the, the last common Y chromosome on all the Y chromosomes on Earth. It's not clear when he lived. Um, people say, I mean, it's a, there's wild guesswork, but people say that it may well have been something like 60 to 80,000 years ago. All right. And once you go back to Adam, Adam's dad had Adam's Y chromosome, and Adam's granddad had Adam's Y chromosome, so you got back to the common ancestor. Okay? And there was an Eve um, as well, with a female ancestor, which you can, of course you can trace with mitochondria. And she probably lived much, much earlier, because the population size of females is much larger in effect the population size of men. So Adam and Eve never met, um, um, even though they did exist. So once you get back to this point, you know, if you think of it the other way, it's a tree that comes up and it begins to branch. Once you get to the top of the trunk, you've got, you've got that. 
see it, <coughs> see what your inbreeding coefficient is. Um, <coughs> well, I mean, again, that's been much talked about. And I think in the, in, in the, in the, the insurance companies got that... I mean, insurance companies work. The way insurance, any kind of insurance works, on, works is on ignorance. They know more about your prospects than you do. Okay? That's the way it works. That's basically it. Um, and when it came to, when it came to, um, to life insurance, they didn't insure anybody because they, they know exactly what the patterns of life and death are. And so they can work it out that they will make whatever they think is a decent profit by charging more for your um, life insurance than, than, than your probability of, of, of living on, of, of dying early actually is. Health insurance, they're much, much more worried, they were much, much more worried about. Because life, you know, life insurance is a binomial property. You're either alive or you're dead. You have nothing in between. It. Health insurance is endless, particularly with the aging population. If you get ill at the age of 40, you could easily be ch charging them huge sums of money, particularly in a the new wonderful health service we're about to experience, you're going to be charging them huge amounts of money for 40 years. So they did get their knickers in a severe twist about 10 years ago about genetic testing. And there were various, um, there were various um, commissions that sat on it, which came to a very, very peculiar, and I've never understood it, uh, decision, which was they, could, they couldn't ask you about genetic tests. Um, because, and what they had wanted to do is say, have you, had your, have you had a DNA? They tried it with HIV. They weren't allowed to say, are you HIV positive? But they were allowed to ask, have you had an HIV test? And if you had an HIV test, of course, that made it much more likely that you were in a risk group. Um, so they put up your premiums. They were stopped from doing that. Um, and they came to, in Britain, they came to this bizarre decision, which I simply don't understand. They aren't allowed to ask you, have you had a genetic test? Except for Huntington's disease. And Huntington's disease, as I'm sure you know, is this very distressing and rare condition that comes on often in middle age. And if one of your parents has got it, you've got a one in two chance of having it. And there's no treatment. And it's it's a whole thing altogether. But why they should be allowed just to have that one is a mystery to me. But I think actually what they've now done is just throw their hands up and say, OK, well, it's just a bit more information. And as I often say, you know, people are often wringing their hands and say, oh, genetic testing, it's going to be awful. You're going to know the day of your death. You're going to know what, that you're going to die, what, you, what you're going to die of. You already know that. I mean, if you walk into a doctor's surgery, <clears throat> your doctor, he or she, can say with great confidence, with, uh, with about an 80% accuracy, when you're going to die. Easy. How old, number of obvious questions. How old are you? Okay. I'm going to die before most of you guys, unfortunately for me. Um, all right. Are you male or female? Women live longer than men. Do you smoke? A uh, big difference there. What's your postcode? There's a 15-year difference in life expectancy between the poorest postcode in Partick in Glasgow and the richest postcode in, on the outskirts of Guildford in London. Um, so what's your, are you obese? And then maybe a technical test, what's your blood pressure? That's got 80% of the information on your life expectancy. For most people, a complete DNA sequence will probably add another 2%. So in the end, I don't think it's going to make much difference. What are your thoughts on indigenous communities where they perceive that they have genetic information to themselves? Yeah. That's been an issue, and I have some sympathy for it. Um, I have a colleague, Andres Ruiz Linares, who himself is a Colombian. And Andres is a very amiable, uh, nice guy. He's a doctor. Um, and he spent his career uh, working on Native American populations, and together with a number of, uh, of uh, colleagues. And Native American populations, the reason people, they're interesting, for a start, but they're also what we call admixed. There are Native American populations. If you go to a uh, native, uh, to an American Indian reservation, people are always startled to see that many of the so-called Indians are in fact black. And that's because there was a lot of mating in the past. Um, and so they've made this map of um, Native American genes, which starts at the southern tip of South America, goes all the way through South America and Mexico, and then it stops. It stops at the American border, US border. And the reason is that Native Americans have persuaded themselves, as it is their right, that this is racist, it's, it's, um, it's exploitative, um, yeah, all these things, and so they won't participate. Now, they have a perfect right not to participate. And one of the reasons they didn't participate was this was sold, not sold. I mean, they were basically... T I remember, I did it. I mean, I just got people to spit into tubes without thinking about it. Um, and, you know, this was regarded as bullying and aggressive. Well, it is, to a degree, 
But where's the harm in finding the information? I don't understand why they're so upset about it. But they have a right not to do it, and they've chosen to use that right. That's an interesting thought. Um, God, I thought of that. Um, well, I mean, <clears throat> I think that's not impossible. I mean, I think you'd have to be pretty inbred to be worried about it. But one of the one of the concerns about sperm donation, um, the, the great the great sperm country of the world is Denmark, okay, and the great sperm city of the world is Aarhus on the on the um, on the uh, on the east coast of no west coast no east coast of Denmark, Denmark, and you know there are in, there are enormous sort of drums like oil refineries on the outside filled with human sperm. I slightly exaggerate. Um, but what, what the, Denmark, for reasons not clear to anybody, uh, they pay donors, which they don't in Britain, and it's become part of Danish culture to, give, to donate sperm. Um, so an awful lot of sperm across the Europe, or European origin across the, sperm, across the world, um, is of Danish origin. And it turns out that some of these sperm donors have had as many as 150 children. Okay. Now, under those circumstances, it's by no means impossible that two half-sisters, a half-brother and a half-sister, will find each other and mate. Um, and that would really, I think, would be a real matter of concern. That they've now limited the number, of, the number of donations you can make. I constantly get rung up by mad people in the media who've come up with a, some story, and I just don't know what it means. It's called the um, genetic attraction hypothesis. That if you meet a missing half-brother or half-sister, you will immediately fall for them. God, if you met my half, but my brother, Jesus. But still, that's another story. Um, um, but I don't, I don't know if there's any truth in that. I haven't seen any evidence that it's true. But I think it's something which there has been concern about, whether they'll go so far as to look for inbreeding levels, that hadn't struck me. They do, of course, look for... I'll, I'll shut up in a minute, but I'll give you a final example. Of course, that happens. There's a famous example where that happens, and it's just amazing. Um, it started off in New York. It's now common in London. There's, a, there's an illness called um, Tay-Sachs disease, which is a very nasty, recessive condition. You need two copies of the gene. And it's a brain degenerative illness. No treatment. The kids die when they're four or five, and it's really horrible in every way. And <clears throat> it's relatively common among Ashkenazi Jewish populations, just by accident, given that every population group tends to have diseases of its own. And in, a, in traditional Ashkenazi Jewish populations, the, um, there is a, quite an important role of a matchmaker in deciding on marriages, which is uh, common across the world. And uh, about 20 years ago, uh, when diagnostic tests became available for carriers for Tay-Sachs, suddenly the, the matchmakers started asking questions. Is there Tay-Sachs in your family? Um, and if there's Tay-Sachs in your family, well, we don't want to marry into that family because it's damaged. And there was a guy called Rabbi Eckstein, who I'd met, who was a very clever guy, who himself had had four children, all of whom had died of Tay-Sachs disease, which was awful. Um, so clearly it was in his family, and it turned out his brother, who was trying to find a wife, couldn't find a wife anyway. So he came up with this fantastic idea. The only danger of having a Tay-Sachs child is if you're both carriers, right? So what now is now done in Orthodox Jewish communities, uh, Ashkenazi communities in New York, in London, many parts of the world, when kids are 14 or 15, they're asked if they want to be tested, and their parents usually say yes, to see if they are Tay-Sachs carriers. But they don't tell them. They give them a, they give them a, uh, a number, 27143. Okay. Then, five, ten years later, uh, maybe they're, they're planning to marry somebody else. So there's a central register in New York, and the, the um, matchmaker says, 27143 is th thinking perhaps of marrying Miss 19326. Are they both carriers? Okay, and if only one of them is a carrier, there's no problem. Okay? But if they both are, the answer comes backwards. There may be a reason for denying this marriage. So in fact, what that is, is an anti-inbreeding mechanism. You're not marrying somebody who's got the same gene as you. Uh, you're marrying somebody who's unrelated. But what it means, and I remember discussing this with Eckstein, what it means is the gene is going to get more common because these kids are not dying off. But I think, um, you know, I think for the greater good, this system works well. And on a cheery note, I should stop. Thank you.
I'm told they're giving away some of my books outside. <laughs> Um, I was going to have a drink with Anna. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 of course not.